Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Andrew Claven, my guest today, was born in New York City, grew up on Long Island, and graduated from the University of California at Berkeley. Andrew is the author of many novels, inc including True Crime, which was made into a movie starring Clint Eastwood, extremely cool, and Don't Say a Word, which was made into a movie with Michael Douglas, also very cool. Andrew Claven's most recent novel, Empire of Lies. Drew Clavin, thank you very much for joining me. A pleasure. Empire of Lies from the dust jacket copy, which is pretty good copy, but who wrote that? Did you I, write the copy? You did? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you always wind up rewriting there. All right. Sustained by a deep religious faith, Jason Harrow, your hero, has built a stable family and become a pillar of principle and patriotism in the Midwest. Then the phone rings. This is gorgeous. Then the phone rings and his past is on the other end of the line. Returning to New York City, Jason finds himself entangled in a murderous conspiracy only he can see and only he can stop. Now, Empire of Lies has been getting a lot of attention because you take what in some ways is a straightforward, gritty crime novel and make your hero explicitly Christian, a believing Christian, a Christian who talks about it, first person novel, and he talks about his faith. If your hero had been completely secular, the plot would have had as many twists, the climactic scene would have been just as gripping. Why did you make him religious? Well, it was the question that the, no the questions that the novel put forward. The, the story, the, the whole thing about building a story like this is what character do you put in the story to make it come to life? Uh, if, you, if you put Othello in Hamlet, the play is over in two minutes. Right. If you put Hamlet and Othello, the play never ends. You have to find the right character for the story. This story raises certain questions about faith, the nature of faith, and the nature of faith as it underlies civilization. And those are the questions that Jason Harrow has to come to terms with as he deals with questions of reality. Uh, this is a man who had a very difficult past, a very degraded past, and who feels that he was changed and made new by God. And the question, one of the questions that the novel asks is how legitimate is that salvation? How durable is that salvation? And how will it stand up against the questions of reality? Uh, what is reality? Who am I and what is reality? And so it seemed important to me that that, that would bring out the depths of the story. Okay. If, if one thinks of Christian novels, one thinks of the Chronicles of Narnia or the Left Behind books. These are books that could be made into movies by Walden Media. Right. Family entertainment. <laughs> Empire of Lies has pretty rough language, frank discussion of sex, and from the moment Jason Harrow, the hero, leaves the Midwest, which is a kind of Eden for him, and is drawn back into his former haunts in New York City, the atmosphere is pervasively th dark and threatening. And uh, I guess from the audience's point of view, or from the point of view, you, you're really mixing genres. Are you doing that to have fun? Or is the way you work, you start with a character and see what, see what happens? I, I don't consider it mixing genres. I, I do right. something with the genre that I don't, I've never seen anybody else do. It's my own specific uh, trademark and my own specific brand of thriller. But I don't consider uh, the genre uh, to be limited um, in, in the usual way. It, it is limited by its necessity to thrill. It should thrill, it should carry you along, it should move uh, like a bullet. But th the thriller genre is really perfectly set up to deal with certain important ideas that are uh, at the center of the Western idea of the individual. Uh, what is reality and who am I and how do I know? Uh, those are questions that can be asked in a thriller uh, with, great, uh, with a great deal of suspense and entertainment. And so I don't consider that mixing genres. The thing that does come across uh, to people as a little shocking and, and throws them back on their heels is that combination that you mentioned before of a Christian man uh, having the kinds of thoughts that he has and having the kind of past that he has. And that grows up out of my own experience of atheism uh, and as a much younger man uh, and reading uh, atheist books and coming upon the works of uh, the Marquis de Sade and 
as I was reading the works of the Marquis de Sade, and he was a, a philosopher, a pornographic uh, philosopher, but a philosopher nonetheless. And I was struck, I remember, by the fact that that was the only honest atheist philosophy I'd ever read. It was the only philosophy that hung completely together. And that was, for me, the wall. It was at that moment when I saw where I thought atheism naturally led and started to recoil from it. And so in Jason Harrow's trip from atheism to faith, I take him through that rather degraded and frightening territory. And it would have been dishonest to leave it out, and it would have been dishonest to think that upon finding faith, it was all washed away and his mind became squeaky clean. I have, uh, I, I want to get to your political view, I want to get to a lot of topics, but one more specific to the novel, which is that, as I said, this, the Eden, the idyllic first uh, chat opening is set in a suburbia in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. He's drawn back into New York City, which is gritty and dark and oppressive and threatening, and drawn up in a, it discovers a conspiracy, which involves Islamic radicalism, and it turns out that the, well, since we're talking about genres, I suppose I can use the term, the mastermind of the conspiracy is in a major university. Yes. And so this strikes me as a little odd. You're a Berkeley man. Your father-in-law, Thomas Flanagan, a very fine and famous and accomplished novelist, was it, taught in the English department at Cal Berkeley for a number of years. There's every reason for you to feel perfectly at home in the setting of an elite university. And yet when an elite university shows up in this novel, it is, uh, it is a, well, wicked. There's a, lots of bad stuff. It's a nexus of bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, does that strike you as unrealistic? I mean, I, <laughs> I, have, to, I have to say that it's my, it is really observation, and especially the kinds of universities that I'm dealing with, uh, what, what Harrow sees in the university is he sees the core of a kind of soft terrorism, uh, a terrorism of ideas, uh, a way of dismantling the things that we uh, have built in our tradition uh, from the bottom in a soft way, in a kind of reasonable way, uh, in a way of misusing reason to destroy reason. And he has this kind of nightmarish experience where the two, uh, the kind of violent terrorism and this soft, quiet terrorism come clashing together in his mind. Mm -hmm. And he has a vision almost of what this is doing to this society, this country that he loves. I want to get to the political Andrew Clavin. You wrote last year in City Journal uh, in an article entitled the, uh, the Big White Lie, I think it was, yeah. White Lies. Quote, leftism, leftism has outlived its own failure by hiding itself within the most labyrinthine construct of social delicacy since Victoria was queen. Close quote. Explain that. It seems to me that in the period that we will loosely say goes from the, the summer of love to the fall of the Berlin Wall, an argument was put forward uh, that Western civilization was in error, Western civ had to go, uh, that we were wrong on every count, on our uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, on our tradition of personal liberty, capitalism certainly was wrong. It seems to me that argument has failed spectacularly in every way, in every aspect. And so now, when you're, when you're dealing with an argument, when you're holding on to a philosophy that has failed, what have you got left? All you have left is insult and ridicule and a sort of uh, putting, territory, uh, putting borders around what can be said. Uh, they call it political correctness, but that doesn't quite cover it, does it? Uh, whenever the it's right... It's really intimidation. It's intimidation. It's bullying. Correctness, it is. It? it is. It's bullying and intimidation, and it works through politeness. It doesn't work really uh, through uh, people burning books or uh, shouting or throwing uh, bricks through your window. It works by making you a pariah by expressing when you express your beliefs. So people say you're a racist, you're a sexist. That's disgusting. That's dis how could you say it? it's unacceptable. And, and they have built this up. And what really frightens me and kind of uh, annoys me is that the right has to some degree taken this on board and has started to speak in these kind of, you know, I don't want, mean to sound like a racist, but, you know, and I right. think that that needs to be rejected. I think we need to speak out in, in the plain understanding that we are not racist or, or sexist. Or were you a like conservative that. when you were at Berkeley in, what was it, the mm -hmm. early 70s? No, I was, I was, it's, this is, it's hard to explain to people who are not in the arts how completely 
leftism during this period of time uh, was the atmosphere you breathe, was the water you swam in. I was always a disgruntled liberal. I was always, I always knew something was wrong, and I can pick out things along the way that just drove me crazy. I mean, I remember uh, affirmative action, just thinking this is, you know, this is a, a dead end uh, in terms of, of thought, in terms of the ability to think. Um, but it never occurred to me that the air I was breathing w was wrong. That it was so comprehensively wrong. Yes, it was like being in the Matrix. Remember the movie The Matrix? It was like a complete imitation of reality that you really had to start to poke your finger through and start to see outside that there was another reality that you could have. So I was, I was really, um, would have con called myself a liberal almost uh, to the fall of the Berlin Wall. The fall of the Berlin Wall, all right. So right through 1989, so you have been now um, out as a conservative <laughs> yes. for a decade or so. Yes. Right? Okay, all right. Um, now you're uh, on andrewclavin.com which is where I want to hold this book up at least once a segment, where, which is a good place to go to read reviews of Empire of Lies, your latest book. You have posted a review of this book that was carried by the Associated <laughs> Press, and which is too wonderful not to quote no. out loud. So listen to this. Through his hero, Clavin tells us, among other things, quoting this review, tells us, among other things, that the entire media is a left-wing conspiracy, that taxes steal from the rich to give to the poor, that America is in a holy war with Islam, that the truth about darned near everything in the United States is obscured by a blizzard of politically correct lies and that anyone who disagrees with him is deluded, close quote. To which you, Andrew Clavin, have posted this reply, quote, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> you have a and, problem. okay, do you really mean that? Uh, do you really mean, uh, yeah, or do you, do you subscribe to everything they charge you of, accuse you of subscribing to? Well, first of all, I mean, as you know from reading the book, the hero is not an entirely reliable narrator. He's no. a, a man uh, who himself is wondering whether he's gone mad, right. uh, who questions himself in every step of the way. And to me, the questioning is part of our great Western tra tradition uh, that I think we're in danger of losing, that self-critical questioning. So the idea that anybody who disagrees with the hero uh, is somehow deluded or corrupt, no, of course I don't believe that at all. Um, but I do think he puts forward, the hero puts forward a fairly legitimate and comprehensive view of the situation we're in, and especially the situation, which I think is very much uh, undercovered and underthought about, that we are in an argument about spirituality. We are in an argument, a violent argument. This war on terror is a violent argument about God. And I think that that is that is the thing that he puts forward, the hero puts forward, that makes him a pariah. And while a pariah to the reviewers of the Associated Press. Yes, and to the people in the book, and, and many to the of the people, people in the book. book. All right. Now, I want to move to spiritual questions in a moment, but this book is called Empire of Lies. Your article in the City Journal of last year was entitled The Big White Lie. Mm -hmm. You say this reviewer accuses you of claiming that Darn near everything is obscured by a blizzard of politically correct lies. Lies, lies, lies. The question is, how do you explain this preference, at least in elite culture, in universities, in the arts, in the world where you've spent a lot of your time moving, the preference for lies, for unreality, over reality? Well, I, I think to begin with, you have to go back to the idea that so many of the, the things that they put forward failed. So many of the ideas that they put forward failed. Uh, we saw a, a, a generation, a single generation, in which materialist, communist, um, uh, atheist governments destroyed more lives mm -hmm. than all religions put together ever, in a single generation. Now, when you're left with that, you either have to look in the mirror and say, uh-oh, I've missed the target rather badly here, or you have to start paddling really hard, and you have to create an, il an illusionary world, an il you know, a world of illusion in which what you're saying makes some kind of sense. And that's what I think political correctness is, and that's why I think political correctness is so offensive. If there's, if there's one thing that is urgently important in a world where individuals are respected, it's a respect also for authenticity, uh, that a man should be what he seems to be. Political correctness is almost it comes very close to legislating in 
authentic behavior. Uh, it tells you what you must think and what you must say in order to be good. And that is essentially telling people to lie. Because if we can't explore our thoughts, if we can't speak our feelings without being completely uh, ostracized, um, how can we ever reach that place of authenticity? Uh, so I, I do believe, I do believe that we have attached, or at least the left and the media especially, has attached a sort of virtue uh, to being inauthentic uh, through political correctness that I just think is deeply, deeply offensive and destructive. Segment three, faith. Some guys, I'm quoting you, you said this in a recent interview, some guys are born where they want to be, Catholic, Jewish, Baptist, whatever. My life has been more like one of those outward bound programs <laughs> where they drop you far from home and you have to make your way back with a piece of string and a matchbook, close quote. Explain. <laughs> well, I was born uh, a Jew uh, in a household of, um, uh, where we were raised in the Jewish faith but without faith. Uh, we were essentially told, this is nonsense, but you must learn it. It's part of the tradition. Uh, when I was bar mitzvahed, um, I felt a terrible sense of shame, a deep sense of shame, uh, that I was speaking words and speaking myself into a tradition that I knew I didn't accept, that I knew I didn't hmm. believe in. Uh, at, at the time, uh, where I grew up, uh, you were given a lot of jewelry at your bar mitzvah, and I received what, what must have been thousands of dollars worth of gold bracelets and pens and money clips, and, uh, and I put them all in a, in a, a jewelry box uh, that I would occasionally, I'd never have worn much jewelry, and I would just take it out occasionally and, and admire it. And about six months went by, and this crushing sense of dishonesty and shame uh, finally reached me. And I waited one night until everyone went to sleep, and I took this jewelry box downstairs and, and stuffed it into the outward bound garbage under. I can remember to this day the feel of the washed out eggs and coffee grounds in my hands. I buried it so nobody would see it and threw this jewelry away. And that was for me to be the end of my relationship with God because I didn't want to be involved with anything that made me feel that inauthentic, that uh, dishonest. Mm. Um, and so that's a long journey to make. Uh, to Christianity. Uh, that's a, a, a place where you're sort of, Christianity isn't even a light at the end of the tunnel. Now, well, so, so you're raised effectively, it wasn't Judaism per se that you were rejecting, it was the entire notion of God. It was, it was uh, is I, that so? I made, I made the mistake which I see many, many people make, including uh, atheists as famous as Richard Dawkins, uh, I call it the Santa Claus mistake. They discover there's no Santa Claus, so they think there's no Christmas. Uh, and I had discovered this, this rather rotten foundation for me uh, of a, a belief system that you were supposed to subscribe to without believing in it. And in my family, obviously, this is not, I'm not talking about Judaism in general. I'm talking about the way it was taught to me. Um, and so I kind of thought, I'm through with all of this. Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not, but certainly not in any kind of religious uh, way. Uh, certainly not in any, as they say, organized religion uh, was over for me. You wrote in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, quote, the presumption of atheism proceeds without respect for the human experience of God. Tell me what you mean by both terms, the human experience of God and the presumption of atheism. Well, this is, for me, central to the entire conversation. Um, let me tell you a dirty story. <laughs> you look like you're over 18. Uh, when I Barely. <laughs> when I first uh, moved uh, with the woman who is now my wife into a, a brownstone in Manhattan, I was on a narrow street on the west side, and you could see through all the windows of the apartment across the way. And a young couple moved in, put their bed next to the window, and proceeded to make love with the curtains open throughout the day. And I, of course, being a hard young... Hard to do any writing. It I was imagine. hard to do anything. You know? was, and, and I remember looking at this and, and thinking, this looks... They were quite an attractive couple, and yet it looked kind of ridiculous. And it looked obscene would be the only thing. I, and I one day said to my then-girlfriend, look at the things that they do. And she said, but we do all those things. And, of course, I realized that sex and everything are given meaning by the internal experience, which has no material nature. Um, it may arise out of our material, it may arise out of our flesh. Mm -hmm. But that internal experience of life, that individual human experience of life, which is immaterial, ultimately, 
is what sanctifies our lives, all of our most important actions. Without it, everything turns into a kind of pornography, not just sex, almost everything. Just moving meat. Yes, exactly. Meat puppets, meat puppets. Um, and I feel that the presumption of atheism, which has become the presumption of our intellectual conversations, uh, most of... That is to say, presuming that atheism is the accepted position. It, it is the default position of our intelligentsia. All right. And so anyone who disagrees, it, it is the burden of proof or the burden of conversation rests on the believer. That's right. what you mean by the presumption? Yes. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think, the, in fact, the exact opposite is true. Um, I think that the burden of proof that, uh, that this experience means nothing uh, rests entirely with the atheist. Um, and and that, that that experience is difficult to know, difficult to define, difficult to put borders on, uh, to limb, uh, all of that's true. But that it's non-existent, that it's unimportant, uh, that it is not part of what we're doing here, and the, the urgent part, I would say, of what we're doing here, um, that's got to be a mistake. It has to be a mistake. Um, we'll gallop now through a couple thousand years of theology in a minute and a half, but <laughs> I just want to see what you do with Christopher Hitchens, who's a highly accomplished writer, mm -hmm. very clever, and frankly, to me, an irresistible man. I just, yes. he's a lovely man, mistaken on a few large points. But Christopher's, you sort of have to con contend with Christopher. Hitchens writes, quote, of the exorbitant, fa this is a criticism of Christianity specifically, not belief, but Christian belief, the exorbitant fantasy of forgiveness whereby one's own responsibilities can be flung onto a scapegoat and thereby taken away. In my book, Hitchens's book, I argue that I can pay your debt or even take your place in prison, but I cannot absolve you of what you actually did." Close quote. The fantasy of forgiveness. No, I think he's got it wrong. I think that, I think that he's, first of all, he's starting from the wrong place. He's thinking of um, evil deeds for which we can be forgiven. But I think if you read Genesis carefully, uh, it, it really puts forward the notion that there is a sense of shame inherent in being a human being. Uh, and that is, that is what part of what the, whole, the 60s were about, is we're no longer going to feel guilt, we're just going to be free and we're going to love freely. And of course, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. you know, why doesn't it work? Well, because inherent in the knowledge of good and evil, inherent in consciousness and self-consciousness, is a weird sense of shame that we are also meat puppets, that we are also these objects being moved about by nature. Um, it's not necessarily our evil deeds that uh, we are asking to be forgiven for, it's our humanity. <coughs> okay, and, uh, but the f forgiveness is not a fantasy. I mean, you can take everything that you just said and the answer might be, and, and therefore we invent the notion of forgiveness so that we can live with ourselves. Of course. You can, you can always make that argument. You can, that, that was one of the uh, stations on my, no road, big on, on my road to faith, was that you can always make that argument. Uh, you can never know. You can never know that, that you're not uh, going down that road. That's why it's called faith instead of knowledge. You actually, in, in the atmosphere of unknowing, in the knowledge of unknowing, you make the decision to believe. You don't make this decision to believe because you saw a big finger come out of the sky and write, you know, maybe you did, I, I never did. No. Uh, um, you, you make the decision to believe and then you see, having made that decision, whether your concept of reality uh, becomes untenable. And my experience has been exactly the opposite. Having made the decision to believe, I feel that I understand reality far better. I feel that um, my insights are closer to the bone. All right. Segment four. Uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous, Hollywood. <laughs> Two of your novels, True Crime and Don't Say a Word, have been turned into movies, and you wrote a screenplay for a third movie, A Shock to the System, which starred Michael Caine, which is in, uh, the coolest of all. He's, in my oh, humble he's opinion, great. he's I, just superb. Unbelievably great. Yeah. And yet you wrote of the motion picture industry this past summer that you are, quote, ashamed of the industry, close quote. Go ahead and explain that. Well, I'm, it, it really has to do, first of all, I, I believe that people should believe what they believe and express what they have to express. However, we are in a specific situation, which is that we're at war, and we're at war with people who seriously want to destroy us. And our soldiers, our mother's sons, are out in the field 
uh, fighting a, a specific kind of war, which is a war of counterinsurgency. In that war, and I, I went to, I actually went to Afghanistan and was embedded for two weeks because of this, be, because Have you to written show about this that to yet? Myself, I've just finished the article, oh, sorry, the sorry. City Journal it hasn't sorry. come out yet. In a war of counterinsurgency, one of the most important things they have to develop is goodwill with the natives, the people who are not the terrorists. You have to establish goodwill between our guys and through our guys, the central government that we hope will come in and replace the outlaw government that we chased out. Right. To make films which are beautifully done propaganda instruments for the enemy is an act of wickedness. I don't think the people who do it are wicked. I don't think they're evil. I don't think they're saying, oh boy, we're going to get our soldiers killed. We're going to make it harder for them. I think that they're living in a narcissistic fantasy where they, they are do, doing something heroic while our soldiers are fools being abused by neoconservative madmen. I, I think that that is, I don't want to say it's unacceptable because I don't, I'm not a censor. I don't want people to stop. I think morally they're making the wrong choice and I think they should make another choice. I want you to explain what they're doing a little bit further. You, in an article you wrote for the City Journal, quite a long piece um, in which you reviewed a bunch of films that had come out in the last 18 months or so, right. and you drew the comparison, which all of us feel, between Frank Capra, a Sicilian immigrant who became a profound American patriot right. and produced films which were critical of aspects of American society, um, it's a Wonderful Life. There's a sharp edge toward capitalism sure. in that, but it's mm -hmm. fundamentally embracing of American values. You talk about Jimmy Stewart, who signed up and flew missions during the Second Major World War. Yeah. These people are patriots. Right. All right. And then you talk about Oliver Stone, who served in Vietnam and had a horrifying experience and then produces uh, Platoon. Right. And the notion here is that Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart believed in America, and along came the next generation. The Vietnam experience was disillusioning. I can understand all that. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, there were reasons. You could have a good, long argument about whether we ought to have gotten into Vietnam. You could still have a good, long argument about capital. A, now the arguments are over, as you point out. But B, nobody in Los Angeles, you know the town better than I do, but nobody in Los Angeles feels sympathy toward the views of radical Islam. Right. So what do they think they're doing? Well, I mean, I, mean, I can no. understand the anti I can understand no. the 60s and 70s and early 80s even, but I can't understand the motivation now. Well, one of the things that happened on 9/11, I mean, with the upsurge of radicalism with, with its forcing itself upon our consciousness is multiculturalism, the logic behind multiculturalism was destroyed, was obliterated. This idea that that all cultures are the same. If we could only understand that all cultures are equally worthy, we would stop fighting. Uh, this song, this jangling ditty that I despise, that John Lennon's imagined, uh, oh, this right. idea that if we could just get rid of all the things that make us human, we wouldn't have to fight. Well, that's true, but it's the philosophy of a cow. I mean, you sit and you have nothing to love, nothing to uh, bring out yourself or the best in yourself. So Now even, you've gone too far, Clay. <laughs> now you've attacked, attacked Lennon, John Lennon. John Lennon. <laughs> It, so even though you say that they don't agree with radical Islam, they refuse to see radical Islam. Uh, what they see is the, the usual blame America. It's our fault. It's our nemesis. It's the, uh, the payback for our Western sins. And to be honest with you, to be honest with you, the, the generation of the 60s, the guys like Oliver Stone, came by that idea. He was being authentic. On their own. He was being authentic. I disagreed with him then. I disagree with him now. But it was an authentic idea, even though it was kind of stolen from a European notion. These guys are frauds to me. They are making movies that are about Vietnam. They have not seen... The reason, the reason I went to Afghanistan is I thought, I have to be able to say this authentically. I have to be First able order to say... reality. Right, right. I have to be able to say that our armed forces are no longer that force of draftees thrown into a war they didn't completely understand. Every single one of our soldiers signed up or re-signed up after 9-11. The, the term, the longest term is six years. So every single one signed up after 9-11. Every single one knew where he was going, what was going to happen to him, and has an idea of why it's the right thing to do. Those guys do not appear uh, in the movies. 
And you know, it wouldn't bother me so much. It, the movies that Hollywood make, that Hollywood makes, never bother me so much as the movies they don't make. If there were eight films attacking our troops, I would still despise them for making them during wartime. But if there were eight films supporting our troops, I know that those films would, would win out with the audience, and I know their arguments would be better, and I know that a depiction of life would be more realistic. Those films aren't being Can made. I just say, last question in this segment. Do you get the feeling that Hollywood today, this notion that the arts are always on the avant-garde, the cutting edge, my feeling is that's nonsense. At the present hour, they're a lagging indicator. You could parachute into Kansas, anywhere in Kansas, walk into the nearest diner and find people who have a much more acute grip of reality than you could by strolling up and down Wilshire Boulevard. No question about and it. And so is it purely a question of time? Uh, all these studio heads who are in their 60s are going to retire soon. Let's, let, you know, my view would be let's buy them places in Switzerland and clear them out. <laughs> let them in, go. In other words, is there, is there going to be just kind of a healthy turnover or is there... Or is there a more a kind of an enduring ideological fight that has to be fought? Uh, I, I'm very optimistic. I think there is an enduring ideological fight that has to be fought. I think the reason they're a lagging indicator, a perfect phrase for them, because they are straitjacketed by their ideology. They're the most conformist uh, group of people, backward group of people you can imagine. Um, but we, conservatives, have let them get away with this. I've said this again and again, but if you win the White House, if you win the Congress, if you win the Supreme Court and lose the culture, you will lose the country. It is the culture that, you know, Shelley was right, the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. It will take a longer time, but if you lose the culture, if you let them drip this poison into the consciousness of America forever, they will win. And I think it really is going to require, I'm very optimistic about it, but it is going to requ require an effort to take the culture back from these people who are, as you say, uh, conformist, backward, uh, living in the ideology of okay. a generation ago. Final segment, politics and the culture. Um, I'm going to read to you something that you put in the Wall Street Journal earlier this summer and give you a chance to recant. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, there seems to be no question, wrote Andrew Claven, that the Batman film, The Dark Knight, is at some level a pan of praise to the fortitude and moral courage shown by George W. Bush in this time of terror and war, close quote. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what, you know what I Are you going to stick with that one? What, what I love about what you just said is you, it was a perfect imitation of the argument that is used to shut conservatives up repeatedly. Aw, oh, come on. Because, because the arguments of the left have failed, they have fallen back on ridicule and exclusion uh, so that they don't say to you, well, George W. Bush was wrong this way, this way, and this way. What they say is, George W. Bush, aw, oh, come on. Dick Cheney, I mean, Dick Cheney has become a curse word, you know, on, on, the, le on the left. And it when I wrote that piece, which I thought was obvious, by the way, I, I, I think you can't watch the Batman film without seeing what I saw. It, it touched off such an incredible firestorm that I knew I was right. I mean, I, I, because, because what I had said was, I don't accept it. I don't accept that I'm excluded from the elite, from the intelligentsia, because I think George W. Bush has done some things very, very much that are, that are right. Uh, the point that the piece makes, uh, the, the most poignant con connection between Batman in the movie and Bush is that they both sacrifice their popularity to do the right thing. Mm. And th what the left has is this kind of, oh, look at his po uh, popularity polls. Look how low they are. Uh, look how silly he is when he talks. Look at the mistakes he makes with his language. Um, that, it's that kind of ridicule that's supposed to keep It's you, not argument. It's, it's not, ridicule. It's not argument, and it's meant to keep you from even opening your mouth. Uh, the way they talk about Rush Limbaugh is a perfect example. Right. They don't say, oh, Rush is wrong about this, this, and this. They say, oh, Rush Limbaugh, how could you? How oh, could oh you? come how on. Could you? Oh, come on. Oh. So I will not recant. Now, let me push. Uh, I'll try what I think may be a more sophisticated argument than, oh, come on. <laughs> it's the role of the artist, sanctified by several centuries, at least, of Western experience, to stand at one remove from society, to criticize to challenge. You could even argue, I'm not sure that I have the historical knowledge to 
take a whack at this one, but you could even argue that it traces all the way back to the Hebrew scriptures where you have the prophetic voice challenging the king, challenging the society, challenging the priestly caste. And you don't want artists to do that. You want them right smack dab in the middle of society celebrating conventional values. You're attempting to undermine the most important role the artist can play. <laughs> Not in the least. First of all, when I hear... When that I was hear, pretty good. That was good. I, 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 all right, all right. Okay, <laughs> go admired, ahead. I admired it. It sounded sincere. When I hear artists today talk about speaking truth to power, I always ask myself, who is the power in this artist's life? Is it really George W. Bush, who has no concern with them whatsoever, no power over them, no power to stop them? Or is it the cultural um, facade, the cultural infrastructure that gives them praise, uh, that gives them access to work, uh, that gives them awards, that gives them respect, and artists die for respect. You know, they live and die for respect. It really is these people who have confined them to their straitjacket of ideology that they never challenge. They never challenge that structure. They challenge a structure that really is not affecting them because in America, artists are free. Uh, if we were living in a Soviet-style society where they were stomping... Solzhenitsyn their, spoke truth to power. Exactly. That's, that's, truth to that's power. speaking truth to power. Okay. But, but these guys are not really doing that. And I am all in favor of the artist being critical of uh, our, our society and questioning our society, even being revolutionary. But that's not what these guys are. They're just okay. conformists. Let me put the same question in a slightly different way and ground it in Empire of Lies, your new novel. Here's a quotation from Empire of Lies. The day it began was an autumn day, a Saturday afternoon in October. I was sitting in a cushioned chair on the brick patio at the edge of my backyard looking down half an acre of grassy slope to where my two boys were organizing some kind of frisbee game around the swing set. I loved our neighborhood, Horizon Hill, the hill for short, big yards, craftsman houses, lake views, friendly, mostly like-minded people, hardworking dads, housewife moms, not too many divorces, lots of kids, close quote. Andrew Claven, I charge you with having become irretrievably bourgeois. <laughs> you are attempting to do something that cannot be done. You're a novelist. You seek to inhibit, inhabit the world of the entertaining, the hip, the cool. And yet here you are, as a Christian and a conservative, holding up for praise the square, the unhip, the conventional, you will never be cool again. <laughs> I may never be cool again. I'll certainly never be called cool again. And yet, and yet, I cannot help but think, I cannot help but think that at the center of the arts, uh, at the center of, because at the center of human life uh, is the experience of love. And that love is not excluded from the suburbs. Uh, it's not excluded from the bourgeois life. It never was. It never has been. It frequently finds its, its best uh, ground to grow in there. Um, my life is deeply affected by my marriage, which is an anomalous marriage in its, uh, in its romance. Uh, and it's been a 30-year romance, and that's, I know that's anomalous, and I know that's not something that everybody gets, and yet it does give you an insight that this is a possibility, uh, that love in marriage is a possibility. It, it can stand to, up. It seems to me that that possibility has been excluded by the so-called avant-garde, who really are the behind guard. Um, it's, it seems to me that that possibility has been excluded and that putting it forward is in fact a revolutionary act. Putting it down is in fact saying, you know what, <laughs> you know, this is here, you can't close your eyes to it, you can't constantly tell us that all marriages are who's afraid of Virginia Woolf uh, without us coming back and saying, you know, I live in this neighborhood and I see marriages that aren't like that at all. Andrew Claven, I pronounce you cool. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so for much. joining us. Andrew Claven, the author of Empire of Lies at the Hoover Institution. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.